Good day, folks. Good to be here with you again. Just a week has gone by since um, we celebrated uh, Easter Sunday, and I pray and hope that you had the opportunity to uh, worship and, and lift your voices to acknowledge the wonder of the risen Christ uh, who has saved us from our sins. So we're moving on now. Uh, into uh, the sermon series that we had been doing before, uh, before Christmas, before the Christmas, uh, before the Easter break, pardon me, I got myself all messed up there, before the uh, Easter break and, uh, or the preparation for Easter. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going back to Psalm 119. Um, I just want to share a bit of a sto- the story of uh, Kristen, Kristen Weatherall, uh, who describes a time in her life when her world was turned right upside down, or upside down. It was after a move to New York City, all of her plans and expectations within one month went downhill. This included her personal relationships, her health, her job, her finances, as she describes. These had all changed dramatically and not for the best. Kristen said, quote, I remember weeping on the apartment floor, begging God to relieve me of the pain he ordained for me to bear. And Christian described this time of of her life, uh, uh, quote-unquote, as a season of exile, a season which had begun uh, four years from the time that I'm telling you this story and continues to this day in some way or shape. You see, Krista knows firsthand when hopes and aspirations and plans go terribly wrong. And friends, is this not the common denominator that you and me share with Kristen? We share pain and suffering. Yes, Kristen's experience is Kristen's experience. Uh, When she moved to New York City. But pain and suffering, well, is pain and suffering. For you see, pain and suffering come to all people. And we all know this, don't we? We've all experienced pain and suffering in some form and shape and degree in our lives. We can say, honestly with Kristen, we got the t-shirt with the words written across the front, God help me. Maybe you are in one of these quote-unquote seasons of exile. Today, you feel isolated and alone in your own circumstances. A circumstance that is unwanted, you're confused, and your faith is being tested. And the only thing you really want to do is run far and fast away, as far as possible from the pain and suffering that you are experiencing. You want out ASAP. So the question is, where does one turn when they find themselves in these kinds of circumstances? Careful, please. I ask you for no Sunday school answers. They're not needed here. When pain and suffering has you and me like Kristen weeping on the floor, when confusion rules our minds and our hearts, how do we move forward? Well, with this in mind, please turn your Bibles to Psalm 119. And we pick up where we left off in early December in Psalm 119 at verse 137. Psalm 119, 137. Righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. You have pointed your testimonies in righteousness and in all faithfulness. My zeal consumes me because my foes forget your words. Your promise is well tried, and your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is righteous forever, and your law is true. Trouble and anguish have found me out, but your commandments are my delight. Your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding and give me understanding that I may live. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Please join me as we pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you now as we return to the uh, the sermon series, the path to life, Lord, that you would help us by your spirit and guide us through the rest of this psalm, the remainder of these verses. And Lord, may it transform us and move us to become more and more like your son, Christ. We pray these things for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, as I had mentioned at the beginning, we are now returning where we left off in December with the sermon series, The Bath to Life, the verse-by-verse study of the longest psalm in the Old Testament book of Psalms, Psalm 119. And because we've been away from it for a while, it would be to our profit uh, to be reminded of some of the key features that we have already discovered. And we start by asking this question. What genre of literature are we dealing with here? Well, the technical answer is we're dealing with Hebrew alphabetic acrostic poetry. Well, as we continue through this stanza and the remaining stanzas, let's just keep it very simple and simply remember that we're dealing with ancient Hebrew acrostic poetry. We also find that two key themes surfaced to the front, the four, First, the persecution and affliction of the people of God, and two, uh, the second one, we discovered the word of, that the Word of God is all-sufficient. The Word of God is all-sufficient. And it's these two key themes here in Psalm 119 that affirm the character and reliability of the Word of God. And that the Word of God, as you might remember, reflects the character of God himself. So when we have this in mind, as we consider these eight verses, this stanza before us, we will find that the word of God is righteous and faithful and forever because God is righteous, faithful, and forever. However, there is one caveat that we should keep in mind, that where the word of God is limited by content and information, not reliability, but content and information, we know that God is unlimited. He is not limited in any way, shape, or form in his person. And as long as we keep this distinction, which I think is very important, we will not cross the line by placing the Bible above our devotion and worship of the one true and holy God that the Bible describes to us. Friends, the word of God, according to the apostles of the New Testament, is sufficient for all our needs today. But we also know that God, who is the author of the Word of God, is sufficient not only for today and tomorrow, but forever. So as we look now at our eight verses from a bird's eye view, we find the psalmist here had affirmed the righteousness of God. What he said here in verse 137, Righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. So we can ask this question. Or the question I want to ask here, and ask you maybe, is what is the subject of verse 137? Well, the answer is obvious. It is the Lord, it is Yahweh, it is God. You could say it all three ways. And the psalmist said of God, you are righteous. And you are righteous, and your word, your rules, your just decrees, another way of saying that uh, that term rules is also righteous. The psalmist is saying, O Lord, your rules are right. And we see that the psalmist affirms that the word of God is right when he even confirms it by saying here in verse 144, your testimonies are righteous forever. So what we have here really are two bookends. We have have bookends, not two bookends. We have bookends. We have 137, verse 137, and 144, and everything that's in between. And these two verses highlight the righteousness of God and his word. Remembering the caveat, the word of God is a reflection of the character and nature of God. We don't worship a book. We worship the living God who inspired the written word of God. In light of this, when we see a verse like this, we need to consider a moment what it's saying. So in this case, we need to consider for a moment God's righteousness. Once again, with the help of the Lexham Survey of Theology, which is very helpful for us, and under the heading, The Doctrine of the Triune God, let's take a quick look at the righteousness of God. My friends, when we say God is righteous, we are saying something about God's character. We are saying something about God's nature. So to say that God is righteous is to understand that there is consistency between his revealed will and his actions on behalf of his people. Where do we find his revealed will? We find it in his word. So 
God's righteousness is to understand that there is consistency, consistency pardon me, between his revealed, revealed will and his actions on behalf of his people. So what, what that means when we, when we survey uh, the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation, we find that God's righteousness there is spoken in terms and in the context of his rule and reign as king and judge of creation. For example, in the Old Testament, I'll just give you one example. In the book of Psalms, we have recorded for us there a prayer of Moses. Moses who said, The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Uh, that's Psalm 97, verse 1 and 2. There we have the king on his throne. God is the king and rules and reigns. We go to the New Testament and give you an example from the Apostle Paul's uh, letter, or Apostle Paul's uh, ministry. We find that in Acts chapter 17. And there the Apostle Paul has, had addressed the Greek philosophers of Athens, and he said this about God. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he appointed. Acts 17, verse 30, 31. This man whom he appointed, obviously, we know, is Christ Jesus. So what we find here is that God not only acts according to what is right, his revealed, his revealed will also serves as the highest standard of what is right, or for what is right. That's interesting when you think about our culture today, that we have this ambiguity between what is absolute and what is not, what is right and what is wrong. There's my right and your right, and your wrong and my wrong. Well, in the Bible, we don't have that sense at all when it comes to God's righteousness. His revealed will also serves as the highest standard of what is right. We can go to Deuteronomy 32 for some confirmation here. When you look at Deuteronomy 32 on most of your Bibles, you will find a heading there. It's called uh, the text that follows in Deuteronomy 32 uh, is what is often referred to as the Song of Moses. And Moses said, the rock, that is capital R-O-C-K, that is Yahweh, his work is perfect for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright he is. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 4. I think the point is made well by the scriptures. When God acts on behalf of his people, his actions are internally consistent. There is no contradiction between God's character and his actions. There is no contradiction between his will and his actions. We also see that God's righteousness brings an integration, integration, I should say, and a consistency to the revealed attributes of God. These are those attributes that God only possesses and those attributes that he shares with you and me. For example, the ones that he only possesses is all-knowing, is all-everywhere present in his power, is all-power and his eternality. And those attributes that he shares with you and me are like love and mercy and goodness to mention a few. So in summary, the righteousness of God reveals that we serve a God who is distinct from his creation, that God is more than worthy and able to rule and reign his creation as king and judge. So as we take a closer look at our stanza, we will discover that the righteousness of God not only speaks of his character and nature, but also that God is active and present in the lives of his people. He is not some faraway deity that has set everything in motion and has gone to the Bahamas for a break. God is active and present in the lives of his people. He even describes it that way in the Old Testament, where we see through Jeremiah the prophet, God said, I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24. Remember, what we have here in this, in this uh, stanza, or in this 
in this whole Psalm 119 is a prayer to God. We have been invited into the mind and the soul and the heart of a faithful servant of God here, the psalmist. A servant of God, as we find in the context of this psalm, who had his shares, share of trials and tribulations. And as you read through the 176 verses, you will find a real person struggling with real issues. We see the psalmist turning to God for wisdom and discernment and hope. Uh, back in verse 10, he said, With my whole heart I seek you, let me not wander from your commandments. The psalmist looking toward that day when his salvation will be fully realized. Just like as we are waiting for that as well in this New Testament era. The psalmist in verse 123 said, My eyes long for your salvation and for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. And it's in this everyday context of this faithful servant of God that the troubles and the sinful attitudes and examples of those around had diminished, if you will, or tainted the greatness of God and his word. But it did not taint the zeal this psalmist had for God and his word. We see here in verse 139, he said, My zeal consumes me because my foes forget your words. We know that uh, King David, the psalmist was like King David, uh, who was zealous for the righteousness of God in his word when King David said, For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Psalm 69, 9. And would you know that Psalm 69, 9 was quoted by John in his gospel when God, the Son, Jesus Christ, surveyed the temple one time in Jerusalem during a Passover celebration. And we learn in the second chapter of John that he made a whip of cords and he drove out all those that were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there in the temple. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And Jesus said, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And then he, John, quotes Psalm 69, 9. So I wonder then, have you ever experienced the diminishing of the greatness of God and his word? Let me ask you this question. Ask yourselves, who were the foes that forgot God's words in the context before us here in this stanza? We had already recognized earlier in our series that the psalmist's source was the Torah. That is the first five books of the Bible, the Torah or the law is the, we find that in the first five books of the Bible. And the Torah lays out the commandments, if you will, and just decrees, the right rules, that Old Testament Jews were commanded to follow. You see, Israel had been set apart by God, apart from the nations, to become a blessing to the nations, where God would bless the nations. And herein lies the answer to the question, who were the foes the psalmist described? Well, they were Jews themselves. And here's the point I'm trying to make. We, when we look at our culture, we look around at our families and our friends, our neighbors, we have to realize that we cannot expect unbelievers, whether it is our family, friends, neighbors, and culture, we cannot expect them to have a zeal for God and his word. Why would they? When we look at the body of Christ today and and the cult, uh, Christian culture around us and the evangelical and other parts of the Christian community. Uh, one particular commentator commenta commenting on this particular group of uh, people in the Psalms can be applicable to our times as well. The commentator said, the greatness of God and his word is adversely affected by the troubles and disgrace of God's saints. This was true in the psalmist's place and it is true in the church in general, some places around our time. The awesome God we serve is often diminished and tainted today as well. You know, from the false teachers that are in the church today, error being taught purposely or unpurposely, 
bare face sin in the church or covered over and swept under the rug sin. Church leaders abusing their position and their power, even to the point of spiritual and or physical abuse. Gossip and slander, hijacking churches, causing untold damage, and church splits. You know, one could go on and on. Of course, conflict in the church is going to happen. Things like this happen. Happened in the day of the psalmist and will happen today in the church and tomorrow. And sometimes conflict can lead to healthy churches. And sometimes conflict can produce unity when there's divisiveness. However, when we consider the context in this psalm, this, in this psalm the psalmist lamented his troubles. He said, my foes forget your words, Lord. Verse 139. I am small and despised because of this. Verse 141. Trouble and anguish have found me out. Verse 143, doesn't sound like he's having such a great time after all. And who were these foes that had brought trials and tribulations to the psalmist? Well, it would be those who would have counted themselves as the people of God. And what the psalmist has done here is painted or paints a contrast for us, the reader. We have the righteous God who has given his righteous word. Verse 144, your testimonies are righteous forever. And we have the psalmist who had placed his trust in the word of God. Verse 141, I do not forget your precepts. And this is in contrast to the foes who not only despise the psalmist for his faithfulness to God and his word. Verse, verse 95 would tell us the wicked lie and wait to destroy me. They are described by the psalmist as a people who had forgot the word of God. Verse 139. The foes here in the text that brought great anguish to the psalmist can be found even today across the church of Jesus Christ. But even so, the question that stands out for you and me to ponder, the questions that stand out for you and me to ponder and to actually answer is this. Do we trust the reliability of God's word? Is the word of God, as the Apostle Paul described it to Timothy, breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, and that the messenger of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. My friends, for as much as you and I trust in the reliability of God's word, this is directly proportionate to our trust in God himself, as one commentator suggested. So here it is. Do you trust God? Do you trust God's word? I think we can say with certainty during our time through Psalm 19 that the psalmist had trusted God in his word. Even when in his humanity, in his experiences, in the lowest times of trials and tribulations that came his way, he prayed to God and he asked, when will you comfort me? Verse 82. At times it seemed it became almost unbearable for the psalmist when he said they have almost made an end of me on earth. Verse 87. Yet he was convinced of the righteousness and faithfulness of Yahweh and his word. Was his trust in God some philosophical opinion or idea? Was it some, even some theological statement? No, his conviction and trust in God and his word were built on a real relationship with God in the highs and lows of his life. It was a conviction carved out of his life experiences with God, especially in the face of persecutors, in the face of his trials and tribulations. Yes, he felt rejected by people. But my friends, the psalmist knew that he knew that he knew that he knew that God is righteous that God is faithful and what God promised has been tested time and time again in the reality of life so that he could say with assurance, your promise is well tried and your servant loves it. Verse 140. Well, here we are. So what? So what, pastor? How is this going to help me today? These are questions you might be asking of me. Well, let me ask you some questions. Pretty serious questions. Do you trust God? Do you trust his word? How about this question? Are you saved? Have you repented of your sin and put your full trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for your sins? 
You see, contrary to some Christian teachers and preachers today and others, Jesus didn't die on the cross and rise on the third day to give you a better life now. Jesus didn't die on a cross and rise on the third day so you could be wealthy and healthy. Remember Kristen Weatherall, who after she moved to New York within 30 days, she would find herself literally on the floor weeping and begging God to relieve her of all her pain, confusion, and loneliness. Maybe today you are like Kirsten to some degree and find yourself confused and wondering where to turn. Maybe your confidence in God and his word has taken a large hit. Maybe you are at the lowest point in your life that you've ever been. Maybe you look around and you are discouraged and disappointed and just ready to check out. Maybe your memories of the goodness of God in your life are fading fast. When we look at our text, we know we're far removed from the troubles. It was far removed from the troubles of our day. You and I are not ancient Jewish Old Testament saints. Yet rejection and doubt and feeling small and inadequate have been common to all people since sin entered the world. The world of psalmist was just as unfair and unloving and uncaring, sometimes downright evil, as our context. And it was just as nice and good and wonderful as it can be in our context. Yet notice where the psalmist put his focus. The psalmist held on to his faith in God. In the midst of his afflictions, not knowing what the outcome might be, the psalmist knew that he knew that he knew that God is righteous and faithful to keep his promises. That the word of God is righteous and faithful as God is. He found this in the crucible of life. The psalmist knew that he could trust and he humbly prayed that he could obtain understanding that he would be able to live. Verse 144. My friends, whatever may come our way in this life, we have the righteousness of God in full display in the person of Jesus Christ and his gospel. Apostle Paul said, and put it this way, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the first Jew and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. May God strengthen you in your world and your places. May you see joy tomorrow. And may you know that you are loved by God and that Christ is with you. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for this time. I pray for all who are hearing this, this message. I pray that it's not my message, Lord, that it is your message. You are touching the hearts and minds of many who are like this psalmist, sometimes struggling. And maybe like some others, we're on the top of a mountain and sometimes we're in between. But Lord, sometimes we wonder what it's all about. God, may we put our full faith and confidence and trust in your word because we can have full and, and faith and confidence in you. So thank you, Lord, for your truth. Thank you, Lord, that you are the true, living, and holy, and just God. We thank you for your son, Jesus. Amen. Thanks, folks. Take care. Shalom.